they change. I know that I say that the directive is wrong. Uh, it's not very popular, <laughs> um, but uh, that, that is a co conclusion. Uh, it's my conclusion um, that they don't, uh, don't work. Uh, for example, uh, if a public uh, uh, supply procurement in public supply procurement, uh, where the supplier only ensures the assembling or delivery of goods uh, from manufacturer, uh, there are often uh, few resources involved in the supply chain uh, to which elements of social responsibility could be applied. Uh, however, the re revenues and profits from this uh, performance of the contract are also used uh, to ensure uh, the economic activity of the supplier, including other activities not related to the, the performance of uh, uh, current uh, contract. Uh, so uh, uh, it means that public authorities' financial resources actually co-finance the economic activity of the, of the supplier and it is in the uh, public interest to use these resources as effectively as possible and not only in relation to the part of that resources that are, makes this uh, cost of the execution of procurement contract. Uh, so uh, the elements of social responsibility should be evaluated not only in relation to execution of the specific procurement subject, but to all uh, this uh, supplier, uh, uh, this uh, current supplier economic activity as a well. whole. Uh, so, but uh, right now, according public procurement directive, uh, current regulation, it is not allowed. So, uh, there are a uh, topic I think that must be changed. And. Um, uh, in my opinion, uh, this quality and uh, compliance with the requirements, it uh, in fact uh, shouldn't be separated because it is integrated component of uh, the quality dimension and um, and uh, uh, since uh, if we are talking about construction, uh, since the terms uh, that define the quality of construction works are abstract and widely interpreted uh, from different points of view, it's difficult uh, to establish uh, the ex exact meaning of these terms in order to achieve a satisfactory result. And, um, and uh, uh, if we are looking to construction contracts, there uh, uh, very often we see term normal or ordinary and uh, uh, what uh, one party perceives as normal and, uh, and ordinary uh, depends on many factors. Uh, uh, this task even becomes impossible when the parties decide uh, that a common understanding has not been uh, reached. So uh, if uh, we have no standards how to define as uh, its quality, uh, or it's poorly defined uh, uh, or unclear, it is even impossible to maintain compliance with them. Uh, uh, so uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, findings or conclusions I, I, I found after analyzing, I'm sorry, there is very low. <laughs> and that is coming very, very Ah, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm very sorry. Uh, so when, uh, when I stopped, uh, when I stopped, uh, so about my findings, uh, the main uh, finding is that the quality always uh, has a dynamic or uh, uh, reactive nature. So it's on, uh, always uh, uh, in development process and it can be fixed in uh, uh, time and uh, place uh, because if we are talking about construction projects, then it's uh, uh, projects um, not for one year, it's long term projects. And so we must uh, see what we are going uh, uh, 
we must see our needs in future and it's very difficult. Uh, so there are several uh, several um, aspects what we, uh, what we uh, must take into account. Uh, for example, uh, this um, time component that is associated with uh, quality because uh, um, this quality is uh, related, uh, related to customers' uh, expectations of uh, what they will receive in the future. And uh, this quality is a result of, uh, of the process. So uh, the construction requires a structured process uh, to deal with the dynamic nature of this uh, issue. And um, uh, this quality is tied uh, to the use of forecasting uh, uh, in preparing for desired future. But uh, uh, we uh, we evaluate uh, this uh, aspect today, and it it it, it, it I would like to say that it, it's even impossible to every uh, to make evaluation for criteria which uh, uh, are going to happen after ten or or fifteen or twelve years um, because we don't know what will happen. So uh, other other aspect uh, that. Uh, um, quality is local uh, phenomenon because uh, uh, this quality demands are very um, uh, connected with the local uh, society and uh, the needs and and expectations uh, um, that is uh, that is. Uh, that comes from this uh, regional um, uh, regional influences and and impacted by uh, local markets and and so on. Uh, so um, how much time I have? Not many. And uh, about the, about uh, our conclusions. So. Mm, I, I would like to say that the law, if we are looking to the law today, uh, doesn't continually uh, respond to the demands of the changing world. So, uh, because of terminology is uh, not changed accordingly, and that is why as well quality standards of each construction project will be different, uh, taking into account uh, the customer's expectations in uh, current uh, time and current uh, place. And um, uh, very important uh, element uh, for uh, how to handle uh, with this issue is uh, collaboration between uh, inv involved parties. And it means that not only uh, public uh, uh, party or uh, local uh, this, um, authority, who are going uh, to, to, to purchase something uh, and uh, private sector uh, or supplier, but as well, uh, society must be involved because only society uh, have an option to decide uh, this, uh, their needs and expectations. And um, if we are, uh, if, if we are um, taking account, uh, into account that this process is dynamic and, and uh, uh, so there will, uh, we need uh, some solution uh, how to uh, uh, how to ha how to uh, be in uh, such collaboration not only uh, uh, within this procurement process but in our uh, life cycle of this um, uh, procurement subject. Uh, so I think that uh, public-private partnership is very. A uh, very good uh, an option uh, for long-term projects. For example, uh, how we uh, can uh, in involve this uh, society and um, you know, be in on the same page uh, with society uh, in an our life cycle of this uh, procurement subject. Uh, so. Uh, Another thing is that uh, 
all uh, decisions and uh, requirements uh, that comes from this uh, public authority must be uh, uh, economically um, must be based on economical economical approach. Uh, so this public authority, when spending public money, must think like an investor, and it is not very popular. Um, uh, uh, meaning, be, meaning because um, you know, right now I think uh, that the public authority acts uh, more like an admin public authority administrate uh, public money, but uh, it's wrong because if we are looking to effective results, we must think as uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, we must think, we must think like investor and look only not in a short term perspective, but in long term perspective, how to get this gain, uh, how, how to get this uh, best price quality ratio, uh, how to, to keep the end users uh, and uh, satisfy their expectations. So it, it's about in, in, in investor, not administrator. Uh, so that is uh, one of the main, main um, conclusions have come. Uh, so yes, this this interdisciplinary cooperation is critically important uh, to to determine our uh, quality dimensions uh, that should be assessed and evaluated during uh, the life cycle of the uh, contract, uh, because uh, in principle uh, to determine these needs, uh, firstly, the society itself must be involved. So. Only uh, cooperation and collaboration between uh, private and uh, public partners and uh, society and um, and science as well, because all uh, uh, this uh, forecast must be based on science and, and validated, uh, not only uh, as uh, expectations. Uh, so this is main conclusions I've made. Uh, uh, maybe some somebody has some questions. I know this is very very large topic. But that is why I, I can't uh, show you everything. But uh, yes, yeah, the main the main conclusion is that uh, public authority must think and act like uh, as an investor, not administrator. It's very uh, different approach how we see this uh, today in our country and in other countries as well. Uh, so, mm, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dialiga, for your excellent yeah. presentation. Uh, dear participants, if you have questions, you can ask Suliga now, or you can may ask it after conclusion of all presentations. So, you, you are open for questions or discussions or comments. No. Thank you. I think we can now move to the next presenter and maybe make a small discussion part after conclusion of all presentations. Okay, so my pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker, um, dearest Inga Uvarova, who will present her paper like research on the cooperation and the shared value creation in the circular business, which is uh, very much uh, of my uh, research interests. Like we overlap with our research interests very much, I would say. Uh, also a couple of words about uh, Inga. Uh, she's a PhD candidate in business management. She also holds two master's degrees in economics and education science. She is a lecturer, uh, either master's degree and bachelor's degree uh, in the fields of uh, project management, entrepreneurship, business models, business re risks, circular economy, and so on and so forth. Uh, she's also uh, a business development and sustainability consultant and the owner of the management consultation company, ArtSmart. Uh, she has extensive experience in inter international projects uh, like this and many others, um, which are also related to green business and circular economy. 
uh, also she is a proud mom, uh, I would say. And uh, the floor is yours, dear Stinga. She was my host during my visit in uh, BA School of Finance. I had the chance to meet her students, like give a couple of lectures. Uh, and thank you for that opportunity also. So dear Inga, the floor is yours. Thank you and hello everybody. Uh, after such uh, fruitful <laughs> introduction, I almost lost my words <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and remember the last phrase, what you mentioned about proud mama. And uh, before my presentation, I'm already saying sorry if somebody will run in because all of them are at home and <laughs> can be not so silent, but uh, hopefully everything will 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 go smoothly. Uh, yeah, uh, I will share my presentation, and I wanted also just to add a few words about the project, uh, our project. And uh, from one hand, uh, looking on the agenda. Uh, what uh, kind of topics we are researching and uh, and presenting it sounds and seems uh, a little bit uh, going different directions uh, as you can see from the first presentation what Liga presented it was it it sounded almost like a legal legal area but as as you can see we found in one common project uh, common interests, business and legal issues, and this uh, different sides of partnership. And uh, that's uh, what we're doing in the project. And uh, I was like uh, thinking uh, some keywords about our project. You can see the main questions, what we are researching in the project. But I was thinking that uh, there are a few keywords that uh, unites all of us uh, that will streamline, uh, I guess, through all of our presentations. This is collaboration, value, either this is creation of value or capturing in different terms, and you will going to see it, or these are liabilities as well, and trust. And I guess this is something what, what uh, you either directly or indirectly may find out in our presentations. But uh, yeah, I will move on. With my topic, and uh, as you can see in uh, in this slide, I have basically three elements. What I'm trying to find out some kind of uh, interrelation with. I'm uh, researching stakeholder cooperation, um, and uh, basically in three levels. It's individual level, or uh, let's say promoted or initiated by employees in the, in the organization and most probably not strategically, but occasionally based on interests of employees. Then it's uh, more or less organizational or strategic level where mm, company and management sees uh, cooperation as systematic and important element in a business plan, a uh, business model. Uh, from a simple perspective, it would be just a supply chain where somebody supplies uh, some resources, somebody purchases and, and uh, delivers to the customer where some kind of cooperation exists. But uh, when we take a look on the circular, circular business, it's not so, so easy one. And uh, uh, recently, not just we, but as well also some other researchers are... Uh, have already proposed and investigated this need of uh, some kind of wider cooperation in the ecosystem level. It's not just a supply chain, but basically we talk about some wider uh, cooperation in the ecosystem. And that's something what I'm uh, trying to, to get clear with. Uh, I put all that in the circular economy context, in circular business context uh, that is coming in my next slides. And uh, yeah, I found out that uh, basically these are interrelated actually elements because both of them uh, somehow lead to creation of the value and uh, not just economic value. We are not talking just about profiting or, or creation, some kind of returns and investments, but we are talking about shared value, which means that uh, business deals or tries to not just uh, create revenues and profit, 
but also with the business activities contributes positively to the environment and as well to the society by creating this social or environmental value. Uh, yeah, and it appears from the research where I was somehow, it seems that I was stuck that uh, I was trying to find out what the first uh, cooperation motivates uh, the circular economy principles and then creation of the shared value or the circular business comes first or some kind of ambition to ambitious to um, adopt those circular principles and then it requires some cooperation, but it appears that they are somehow interrelated. It can be both ways. <laughs> Motivation can, can come to both directions. Uh, just shortly about the circular economy. And uh, yeah, this is from one hand, uh, new concept and especially in recent years, uh, really, really increasing uh, and trendy issue. But still, we can see that uh, it's uh, quite small share in the economy, but it's increasing. It's been motivated a lot by different government inter or international organization incentives, but also by changing customer needs, also by new business risks, and also by new technologies that allows us to become more green and more environmentally friendly. But still, we see that entrepreneurs do not recognize circular economy as their um, primer um, way of doing business. They lack like knowledge and practices in, in uh, doing things in a positive way or contributing to the environment. What I'm focusing more, we can talk about circular economy in, in several levels, but uh, our uh, project and my research mostly focus on this micro level on the business management level circular business models where we we talk about different uh, new approaches in the business and uh, different circular principles that can be adopted in the business but also we have seen uh, in our project that uh, it can also be appropriate for other organizations not just uh, private uh, business companies. Yeah, and that shortly, uh, when, when re investigating research about those circular principles, uh, from one hand, uh, it's possible to somehow lose the mind <laughs> because some of researchers also, we really like to play with those letters R, reduce, recycle, reuse, uh that has been like basic principles but then other researchers are trying to play this linguistic game and try to find out some other letters are or those principles some researchers are saying that not all of them are just principles but some of them are strategies some of them are actually new business models and i agree to all of them because when investigating in more details all different principles we can say that uh, even one principle may affect strategic level in the company, but also can change a business model and also can be like just ordinary business day to day activity. For instance, when you are considering about uh, uh, efficiency and saving some resources, uh, which is one of the principle uh, uh, under reuse principle. So most probably some would say that this is efficiency strategy some would say no this is ordinary practice in our business and uh, yeah when uh, investigating in more detail it appears that not always even uh, entrepreneurs recognize those uh, principles that they apply already but especially those ones that are that are on this uh, business process level what they have done before and continue to practice, even do not recognizing that they are more circular they, than they are considering that. But some of them uh, um, requires investments. For instance, uh, most of recycling uh, principles and uh, either new business models or, or some other activities require more, uh, more time. Uh, in larger investments and some more significant changes in the business. 
Yeah, and then uh, moving to the shared value creation, where it leads uh, all those circular economies, uh, circular economy or circular business activities. We talk about uh, some kind of positive impact on the environment. This is key focus area for the circular economy. And Liga was mentioning in her presentation, uh, so corporate social responsibility. We can say that this is some kind of predecessor uh to to as well these activities so, uh, circular economy business activities uh because uh, also in social corporate responsible way we considered as well uh, some kind of positive contribution to the environment but currently circular economy specifies yeah that primary um, business should not just create an economic value, but as well incorporate in the business model or revenue streams, possibilities, how to benefit or, or make some uh, added value as well to ecological problems or, or to environmental issues. And this is not just uh, some kind of social activity or charity or something like that, but this should be a part of the business model and that's why we talk about balancing uh, economic value creation and uh, this environmental value. Uh, yeah, to have such model of shared, shared value creation, it requires some kind of uh, cooperation or collaboration with different type of stakeholders. Uh, and it means that we are talking about value co-creation. Uh, my colleague Ilona will going to talk about uh, design thinking methods, which really supports uh, this value co-creation initiatives. And that's something which is actually necessary for the development of new circular business uh, models and circular business uh, principles in the company. What else? Those great, great uh, professors and other theoretical uh, founders like Porter, they as well have uh, concluded that business nature is changing. It's not just a sharky competition, but uh, this necessity or, or obligation to think about some social issues and environmental issues as well oblige to business. And more and more business is, uh, let's say not obliged, but actually is open to incorporate those issues and this uh, value creation in the business model. And that is that is some kind of uh, future in nearest time for the circular business. And why we talk about multi-stakeholder uh, stakeholder collaboration, it's not just uh, some kind of value creation for shareholders of the company or owners, but uh, when we talk about uh, this environmental impact or social impact, we talk about as well society and the environment as important stakeholders, which should be assumed. Their needs should be understood. Either these are environmental problems or some kind of other social problems, but primarily circular business is focused on those environmental problems. As we can see that... Uh, Social problems uh, indirectly are, uh, are solved by circular business models in different ways. For instance, when uh, companies uh, decide to, um, to use local resources from local farms, it's as well not just environmental, some kind of positive impact, but uh, also social impact. Uh, promoting local business, local entrepreneurship, and, and other such social uh, values. One can be concluded uh, uh, when, when discussing with, with business and enter, uh, representatives and entrepreneurs, they usually say uh, this environmental impact, it's, uh, it's expensive or creation of environmental value it's not feasible, it's not possible, and uh, it's not, uh, let's say, early, uh, short profiting. And it's true, 
uh, from other hand, circular business is not like a religion which uh, pushes us to now just turn all our eyes just on environment. But it is still we keep business interests and we should keep the balance. And balance in between the feasibility, it means is it possible, technically possible to adopt any of those principles that allows us to create this positive environmental impact? Is it feasible? Then there is a question, uh, who are willing that value? Is it necessary for the stakeholders and what kind of stakeholders? Does it respond to their needs? Is it desirably, des desirable for, for the stakeholders? If they like and need that, then uh, again, it's rational. And the third element is financial viability. That's why we are talking about shared value, basically. It's about economic profit, social value, and uh, also environmental value. And uh, moving to the last slides in my presentation, what we have proposed and trying to find out as well some justification in our empirical uh, research uh, that uh, previously uh, there has been already proposals of this uh, triple helix cooperation, quadruplex helix cooperation, meaning that there are several fee fields or sectors that should go together and work together. It's been used in uh, mostly in, in context of innovations. Uh, now we have investigated this, this perfect framework, this quadruplex helix, combining universities or, or researchers, business, uh, public or government sector, and also people or civil societies as quadruplex helix that can be those main stakeholders working together in this uh, in this process when we create uh, the shared value because we can see uh, also it's not uh, not so easy one way because each sector or each part or each helix <laughs> has uh, their own uh, triggers why they want to participate in such collaboration they they have different enablers uh, enablers for this cooperation and also these expectations what kind of values they are expecting from the collaboration can can be different but still we can see that uh, at least those uh, social and environmental values like clean environment uh, social inclusion currently after uh, the especially when when currently there is this uh, Ukraine war situation uh, resilience and social justice and uh, safety and security as well became as 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 really really important issues uh, but still uh, as Liga mentioned it's not so easy to cooperate and it's already been proved as well by some researches that uh, when we define this quadruplex helix theoretically, it sounds quite good. We are co cooperating in idea management, in uh, creating new ideas. But when it becomes to some investments, liabilities, and some other more uh, some other uh, some other issues, so it's not so easy one. In that case, there should be some facilitator that puts together most probably each of these sectors and somehow facilitates or, or, or uh, I, I don't want to say leads that process, but it seems that there should be somebody. And also researchers are talking about uh, certain scale up of cooperation. Oh, there is some, <laughs> some, uh, some abbreviations, but I was meaning that uh, scale up of collaboration or cooperation. At least in Northern Europe, what we are researching, uh, our entrepreneurs are not so active in cooperation. General attitude is to stay away and not to cooperate. And that's something where we need to find out some ways uh, how to promote this cooperation and also those legal issues, how to organize that cooperation. Uh, 
that's I guess uh, is the main from my side some some references that will be available but uh, yeah thank you thank you for your attention thank you thank you Inga again I'll, I'll start uh, with question uh, I'm interested do you have in Latvia any kind of statistics or approach uh, about the numbers, how many entrepreneurs or how many companies are using uh, circular methods in their business or how many companies are interested to introduce these methods? Are there any statistics or any publications about the um, approximate numbers? No, that is some problematic area. It's quite hard to recognize them. <clears throat> And uh, there is not unified indicators how to how to count them. Uh, what I see uh, some uh, quite huge activity from the last year when banks and uh, largest uh, auditor companies they they become quite active uh, in relation to all these environmental, social, and uh, good governance issues and reporting requirements. And I guess in the nearest future there will be some kind of at least i know two auditor companies from from largest uh, companies they are developing certain indicators and they are aiming to find out some kind of ways how to count them recognize them but uh, this is just uh, just i guess process <laughs> Yeah, the only what we have uh, in Latvia, we have uh, established, um, now I need to ask my colleagues, sustainability index rating. But um, actually, this is voluntary initiative where companies can try to fulfill some kind of questionnaire and prove that they belong to, to some kind of grade or level of the sustainability index. But I should say honestly that uh, those companies that that are trying, they are around 100, a bit less. <laughs> so we cannot say about some kind of critical statistics. <laughs> That's a problem as well in my research to get this critical mass, <laughs> reliable mass. Yes, same for me and maybe same for many researchers, including uh many countries from eastern part of europe yeah it's a very new topic and we haven't any data to measure uh some tendencies dear participants are there any other questions or comments for now you are free to ask i think not yet so um uh, we can maybe we can go to the next presenter. Uh, okay, my pleasure to introduce our next presenter, who is uh, dear Zane, uh, also a proud mom <laughs> of two kids, <laughs> and I'm very much follower of her updates during the summer adventures with her family. Uh, Zane is uh, head of uh, lifelong learning center at Reseba University. She has developed study programs on digitization, business communication, and modern presentation. Uh, she is the lecturer, um, as uh, I said. She has experience in uh, creating and providing business support tools, advising, mentoring young entrepreneurs and so on and so forth. So Zana will present uh, her uh, latest research on collaboration for creation of value, quadruple helix uh, approach. So the floor is yours. And as, as far as I remember, you are coming to Tbilisi in October or not? Uh, unfortunately not. Uh, I'm coming uh, next uh, April, hopefully. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm very sad that I cannot visit you guys. Uh, no problem. Talk, so so we're going to meet you in April. <laughs> yes, oh, definitely. Okay, the floor is yours, uh, Anna. Please. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction. And the same as Inga, 
has worried about her little assistants, the same as uh, with me. My kids, they think that they are my assistants, so they really come and go offering me coffee or asking for candies. And I think this evening is not going to be an exception. And uh, yes, I will share my presentation uh, as you already heard and uh, you have seen. Oh, geez, sorry. I will do just one uh, little thing before I start presentation. So yes, I will present my research, which refers to collaboration for create the uh, creation of value. The same as Inga and the same as other uh, researchers here today, I'm also part of this uh, project. And I'm mainly focusing on uh, collaboration topics. And also I'm uh, working very much uh, with uh, uh, the different projects and initiatives which uh, mainly shows how does this uh, quadruple helix approach actually works in real life. So I will also share a little insights of the project what I'm working right now. I'm not uh, yet done with the the, the whole project and also I'm still looking uh, for the uh, legal ways to show all what we have done in project but hopefully soon I will also get uh, uh, the approval. So as Inga already have showed and told what is quadruple helix model I will not uh, stay here for very long but uh, mainly this is collaboration between four actors or third parties you can call it as you wish. And uh, so this is collaboration between public, private sector, higher education and society. And uh, each of the parties are involved in the co collaboration in different ways. And uh, my rule here in the project and my rule, not rule, but my um, the biggest goal uh, in my PhD thesis uh, is to find out what is the uh, main reasons and what is the main um, uh, value for each of the player or for each of the party in this collaboration to participate and take part. Uh, so uh, why this topic and why are we talking so much about and the importance of the collaboration? So first of all, uh, quad quadruple helix model is directly linked to the European strategy for smarter and more sustainable and inclusive growth. And uh, it also shows better shareholder engagement and smarter use of uh, resources. Uh, we also have identified several uh, um, gaps in theory and uh, in research. So that one thing what I'm right now working and why this presentation is more uh, related to society society is that uh, research shows con con contradictions in the context of society involvement and the, if from the very beginning I was sure and I also knew why private business is involved in in such a collaboration why government is 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 very much uh, uh, excited to be part of this in in this um, uh, a collaboration and the same with the universities then uh, from the beginning I wasn't sure what actually society does and what actually society is and how they take part. Also, uh, most of the studies have taken or shows the perspective of a macro uh, economics and involvement of, uh, and uh, the use of this uh, um, quadruple helix model, uh, but what we cannot see that much is this micro value or ma 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 uh, micro per perspective uh, of the research, and that's why I'm also looking more in this direction. How can it can uh, how this also can help um, smaller businesses, smaller collaborations, not only the big one. What we are talking about uh, OCD or or European strategy kind of context uh, strat context strategies. Uh, the one thing what I'm looking and working right now is uh, related with my conceptual framework. Uh, in previous uh, presentations, what I have uh, done in, in, in conferences or uh, also sharing with my colleagues, my, my, my uh, latest researches is more in step by step. 
I did research and I did the um, theoretical uh, conclusion about, as I told, why government, why the private business and why academia is participating in this collaboration. And uh, I was looking for these factors. One is uh, communication quality, opportunity behavior for many, uh, in many cases, it's also financial dependencies. In some cases, it's about scientific needs need and uh, um, the value what universities can uh, give in collaboration in and uh, and then participation in such a project and uh, collaboration and the one thing what we have found uh, and also Inga has mentioned is the lack of uh, trust and uh, this is one of the topics which I'm going to look deeper in context of my PhD thesis, how we can uh, create value and how all of those four actors can actually trust each other uh, to go back to these, uh, this value shared value or value what uh, what what we can create uh, so far i have done some analysis uh, like the theoretical part has been almost done and also i have started uh, to work deeply more deeply on uh, on that uh, uh, that uh, 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 data analysis not an, an analysis but more on uh, on the uh, surveys and uh, thinking how to to make this uh, uh, data comparison uh, and the uh, the main findings, what I have found from literature and also what I have found from working practic practically in the uh, in the projects uh, uh, involved in a quadruple helix model concept, and that uh, most of the times quadruple helix actors take different tools where we can be the uh, to create value to civil society, or we can create a new jobs, products, or services. Uh, from results of literature review, we also I also conducted that uh, the, the, the Fort Halleck Society, as I mentioned before, is unclear. And what can be the society is shown in different directions. And uh, they can be uh, uh, these final final users or, or, or companies, uh, people who are in involved in testing or somehow involved in the um, in the way developing new projects uh, products or services and um, yeah and also what I have mentioned before uh, this extended value uh, or not value but need of uh, trust in uh, in such a collaboration uh, and uh, just in few words uh, up, uh, um, the project I mentioned before, I'm working with uh, uh, with with uh, um, two involved companies, which uh, uh, which representing uh, uh, media than uh, academia. Uh, us representing uh, um, the Reseba University and uh, one of the ministries here in Latvia. Uh, we are working on one of the biggest uh, digitalization projects uh, in Latvia. The main goal is to create uh, uh, study materials and program for uh, people who are working in uh, government and in public service, and also the, find the way how to um, gain the knowledge and uh, practice use of digital tools for society who wants to um, get in contact uh, with the government and the uh, and, uh, uh, people working in the uh, public service and also uh, also yeah other uh, smaller parts of the project involves that uh, that we do teach uh, people in different directions uh, about uh, digital uh, digital skills. So, and in this case, uh, the uh, in my experience, what society does and how society can be involved, not only like the final users, but also in the process of developing. Uh, uh, program in process of developing study materials, video materials, and the content. What we are actually going to each uh, to the fin final users or participants of the lectures, uh, we involved more than twenty five NGOs who work with different kind of uh, 
groups of society. Uh, what were these uh, NGOs? Uh, these NGOs were uh, NGOs who represent, for example, entrepreneurs, accountants, people with uh, disabilities, uh, people uh, from the NGOs who are working with other people, uh, and etc. Also, digitalization centers and and other initiatives which uh, represent. Uh, smaller or bigger bigger amount of the society what they did they were participants of different webinars they before publish and before record and start um, the, the study program we had uh, many uh, meetings where they were uh, um, uh, sharing their opinion about the program, sharing the opinion of the global problem of digitalization or lack of digital skills in, in general in society. Because as we know, if we see, for example, data of uh, digitalization a survey uh, um, uh, called uh, DESI in 2021 and in 2022, uh, it shows that in Latvia, only 43% of citizens from age 16 till age 76 or 79, I didn't want to be mistaken, uh, they are only 43% of those people are able to participate in social life by being digital. They are able to not only send and receive emails, but also contact, uh, uh, contact uh, public service service uh, representatives, they can sign electronically documents, um, they can um, do and other uh, other other um, uh, other things by not meeting uh, in face and face people from uh, from public service. And then other thing what we have recognized that the society and involvement of society also goes to the part of participants. In this particular program, we have uh, so far involved more than 2000 participants, people who were, were or still are participating in the program. They took part as a students and uh, they're learning digital skills skills what I'm what I was talking before uh, some of them are uh, having uh, lectures uh, in zoom some of them took part in uh, fully online courses what we also created and in total I guess till the end of this year we will reach more than 2,000 people something around 2002 hundred um, uh, people who have participated and completed the program with the certificate and the most the the thing what i'm the most uh, proud of those people who participate in these lectures between the two lectures what we conducted them uh, they have tasks they have very simple tasks that they have to contact uh not less than 10 people and help them with digital skills they can inform them about the services what they can do electronically they can help them practic practically uh, they can show them maybe some tips and tricks how to do one or another thing and so far by this task and by this um, movement we have reached more than 15,000 people in Latvia who now knows or have heard something about digitalization, something about cybersecurity, something about, I don't know, e-signature or other things what they can um, benefit from starting to be more digital and be part of this digitalization process. And uh, just to conclude uh, all what I was telling here, I also did some research in, in, in other uh, papers uh, about uh, society involvement. And of course, the most important thing what we can gain and what we can get from involvement society is the knowledge, knowledge for the production and knowledge for innovation, because society is that one 
part, which is usually the final users, and they will also drive innovations in one or another way. And also uh, talking about the, the sport helix or the society uh, that different extents adds uh, to the knowledge of human life, to the innovation process, uh, with the scientific and technology, uh, technological knowledge. And uh, on the other hand, civil society can be also a resource for markets, for companies, for business uh, activities. That means that for companies to adapt the market demand uh, uh, without the risk or involve the society in the product makes more this added value. And also to understand that depending on increasing level of society involvement in this quadruple helix model, innovation practices can be performed more uh, or with uh, by the end user. And of course, in future research, I will also talk more and I will deeply look for this trust and how we can more uh, closely connect all of the players in quadruple helix model, but so far, I think I have found the different ways and different answers, how we can involve more the fourth player in collaboration. Thank you for the attention. Is there any questions you would like to ask to me? Thank you very much. Dear participants, you are free and more than welcome to ask questions to Zane. For me, the most interesting part was a project X. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really great, it's a really great, and it's really important for our modern society. Such kind of initiatives. And if there are any English language versions of about the projects, any English kind of English English links, please share us. It will be maybe more useful for me and for uh, our other colleagues. Yeah, thank you. I will definitely share because I'm in the process uh, with the ministry to be allowed to show the project X in the right name and also use the data and information what I have so far gained also in my PhD thesis, because you saw that we have more than 2000 participants uh, in the program and each of the participants they also have not each of them but something like 1050 participants have also uh, at the end they have filled the, the survey the feedback survey in which I put the question about the uh, value is there any value what is the value and etc and this kind of information of course will be useful for me to also use in, in the research um, when i will start data analysis and hopefully yeah, there will be information also in english great thank we you wish you wish you a success uh, so we can i think we can go to the fourth presenter of the day yes right? a brief comment also from my side uh i have had pleasure to listen to zane and ilona and inga and tatiana and others also uh share my thoughts with them uh, and i think in terms of zane's research uh, she also like, touches the topic of digital trust trust formation uh, issues, which is very much of our scope, me and Tsotnes, and I think during your visit we will have many things to talk about and maybe we can like develop some scholarly publications together as well. So thank you, Zane, for your excellent presentation. Uh, now it's time to move to uh, our next speaker, which is Tatiana Jukna. Uh, Jukna. She will talk. Yeah, sorry for the spelling, wrong spelling. Uh, she will talk about <clears throat> legal problematics of rapid transactions with securities and possible uh, solution. Uh, I'll also uh, say a couple of uh, words about her uh, background. She's PhD candidate from Riga Stradins University. Uh, she's a professional uh, she has professional lawyer qualification. She is also a lecturer and assistant researcher at Riga Stratis University. Uh, she has the background of 20 years, more than 20 years in terms of securities market. So I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. The floor is yours, Satyana. Thank you. 
Thank you. I hope that uh, you can see. Yes. Okay, it's nice. So um, I'm happy to be here to see all of you and to speak with you and to present my research. I'm currently working on, I would say that the topic chosen by me is quite uh, difficult and uh, why I chosen this research and why it is required for Latvia. Uh, I would like to start with brief maybe explanation of the reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, we have no one law uh, where rapid transactions would be described. Uh, any theoretical research are missing in Latvia. And I would say that in Europe also, most of the research are, has, uh, the, uh, have an economical nature, not, an, uh, not a legal nature. And I decided, um, I decided to research these transactions because uh, transactions um, uh, could uh, provide the necessary support to the economy to the new uh, enterprises. Uh, currently in Latvia, uh, we have an active process of uh, IPO when companies is uh, actively trying to attract an investment through securities and through a securities market. So uh, in the future, investors may also need resources and rapid transactions is a type which allows to get short term uh, financing without alienation of uh, securities. So this is uh, the reason of um, um, my research and why I am working on. And before to start, uh, provide maybe some explanations uh, or discuss the problematic of the rapid transactions, I um, now would like um, maybe a little bit uh, to provide more information about uh, what is what REPA is. So first of all, the REPA is a single transaction which consists of two parts, part one and part two namely the sale of securities in the first part of the transaction and um, repurchase transaction uh, in uh, the second uh, part of the transaction. Uh, during the term of the transaction, um, it's uh, between uh, initial date uh, and uh, the date when um, execution of obligations is foreseen, uh, existing obligations between uh, participants or parties of um, these uh, transactions. Uh, these obligations which exist between the parties includes, for example, obligation uh, of the buyer uh, on the first part of the transaction uh, to return the fru fru fruits <clears throat> from securities. I mean, this could be like as a dividend, this, this, bill, uh, this could be uh, any coupons. So <clears throat> also uh, this transaction does not require necessity to return uh, the same securities. It is very important because substituted uh, securities uh, could be uh, returned in uh, results. It means that a buyer does not need to um, held uh, securities all the, during all time of the transactions and uh, could uh, use them. And this is uh, very important uh, from the perspective of um, the transaction. Uh, when we are looking uh, on the definitions of rapid transaction, because my, my research is more theoretical research, more fundamental research um, about my plans, I will um, tell you a little bit later. So uh, I think that a uh, most successful definition uh, which I found is the definition provided by International Securities Market Association. Uh, the definition is very, very simple. Uh, that REPA is an immediate sale of securities and simultaneous commitment by the seller to repurchase uh, the same quantity of the same issues of securities from the buyer in the future at a different price. 
Um, in Latvia, uh, no one, I would say, uh, law. Uh, we are not speaking maybe about rules, some small rules, uh, providing a definition of uh, rapid transactions. Uh, but if we are looking on the uh, regulation of the European Union, uh, EU uh, regulation uh, uh, came uh, into force. This is so-called Securities Financial Transactions Regulation, and this regulation, I, I would say, is um, very important for uh, securities financial transactions. First of all, uh, this regulation applies to all Europe. This is the first point. The second point, uh, the regulation defines the types of uh, security financial transactions. And the third point that this regulation also provides definition of the repo transactions. And following this definition, we could uh, make some conclusions regarding the nature of the, uh, of the transactions and how how, uh, in general, our European legislation looks on the transactions. But what is uh, very important that speaking about securities financial transaction regulations, uh, this regulation is not affecting any national regulation uh, which regulates these transactions. And uh, speaking about um, um, whether these transactions is in force or not in force. So more or less uh, when um, this regulation is not observ observed, only administrative liability could um, be applied to the market participant. But in any way, what is important, we have in European Union an official uh, definition, uh, an official definition of repo transactions. But there I am uh, quite, I, I, I should be quite uh, critic because I checked all translations of uh, these regulations on national languages and what I saw for uh, Latvian language. Uh, if in English definition, uh, the term repurchase transaction is used, while in English also exists the um, definition, how to say the term which we are using, this is a repo. Uh, but in Latvian, this repurchase transaction is translated like as a repo. Uh, I don't think that uh, this um, is, uh, this translation uh, is um, uh, fully um, correct. Uh, I just would like to draw your attention on this fact because repurchase transactions uh, uh, by itself are regulated in uh, Latvian civil law, but they do not correspond to the nature and they have many, many differences with uh, repo transaction as we understanding it on uh, the Latvian market. Uh, and while uh, I start to speak about uh, securities financial transaction uh, regulation, I uh, should uh, to draw your attention to some basic facts uh, regarding a repo and buy sell back transactions, as well as the form of the transactions which is required for a repo. The definitions of uh, those two transactions. Uh, as well, uh, I mean, repurchase transaction, repo transaction, and buy sell back transaction are um, included into the uh, securities financial transaction regulations. So, what we see, we see that a repo transaction, a repo, uh, repurchase transaction is agreement by which the counterparty transfers securities and subject to commitment to repurchase. So, we are very clear see that this is sale purchase transaction. Uh, while uh, by uh, and all these transactions uh, commitment is valid uh, and valid at the moment of the conclusion of the transactions. But when we are speaking about buy sell back transactions, buy sell back transactions, uh, it means the securities are sold and exists how, how to say preliminary agreement uh, to buy back uh, these securities. And the major difference between these two transactions, and uh, I would say that this is very important, uh, the major difference between uh, these two transactions is absence of writing contract. 
So it means that to recognize the transaction as REPA transaction, writing contract is required. And uh, this also should uh, be reflected, I suppose, in uh, the legislation and uh, speaking about consequences uh, uh, of um, um, consequence of these uh, two definitions and how it, uh, which role it plays uh, in the market. So in other words, uh, documented, uh, uh, documented by sellback is a repo transaction, maybe some a uh, little bit uh, different um, mechanic inside, but in any way, this is a repo transaction. But one repo transaction is not documented uh, this is a buy sell back transaction. Uh, I'm looking on this transaction from the perspective of uh, possibility to prove uh, the conditions uh, or provisions of the contract and which liabilities exist among the parties. When I'm speaking about writing form, I am not speaking only that uh, the contract should be or must be on the paper. Uh, I, as well as I suppose that it could be electronic contract. Uh, the major, uh, the main, uh, what should be uh, that we should uh, have a possibility to really to identify the signatories of the contract and to understand who the parties of the contract are. Uh, in literature, uh, in literature, um, are many discussions regarding structure of the trans uh, transaction and um, regarding um, uh, problematic of the transactions. Uh, um, first of all, it shows that uh, repo is uh, loan transactions and um, it's not a sale purchase transactions or otherwise. Such discussions started us from 18th century and has a historical background uh, when initially in and in reality it was like as a loans uh, which was used for uh, for trading uh, for on uh, securities market and uh, under certain conditions when we're speaking uh, when on trading or speculation on securities market looked uh, society looked negatively uh, uh, it was impossible to uh, re recover um, funds which uh, provided for for such uh, such training. It was the first problem, and the second problem of the transactions was connected uh, with necessity to sell on the market securities, which are how to say collateralized or collateral. And when we are trying to conduct some bureaucratic procedures, administrative procedures, which uh, are connected with realization of the collateral, it takes a time and um, the buyer uh, could, uh, could suffer a group losses uh, due to the market change. As well as uh, many discuss discussions was about uh, structure of the transactions, whether this is one transaction or two transactions, two separate transactions. So currently, uh, uh, currently it is recognized and we saw it uh, and I showed it to you from the definition, which is in your, uh, your regulation that this is one transaction which consisting of two parts. But when we are uh, looking on the repo from the perspective of two transactions, this transaction is a buy sell back transaction. So the, this this is this is a huge uh, differences, as well as uh, when we are analyzing the transaction from the perspective of uh, Latvian law, especially from the point of reports transactions. Um, uh, I should to say that um, the major difference uh, is that first repo transaction. Uh, uh, the second part of transaction is not a right, it's an obli obligation. This is mandatory obligation while repurchase uh, transaction under the civil law. Uh, this is the rights. And the result of the repo transaction and status of the ownership rights are first seen at the beginning of the transaction because ownership rights should, uh, uh, ownership uh, rights 
should be returned, passed back. But when we are speaking about a purchase transaction, uh, the status of the ownership rights uh, is unclear uh, till the date uh, when uh, when transaction ends, because during this time, uh, the seller could utilize uh, his rights and to uh, repurchase securities. First of all, and the second, uh, speaking about um, uh, a transaction um, as well. Um, repurchase transaction, like as a, any sale purchase transaction under Latvian law, is um, 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 not real transaction, but um, consensual transaction. It means that agreement stays in force uh, at the moment when uh, when when uh, when contract um, is signed. But when we are speaking about real transaction, real transaction stay uh, stay in force uh, stays in force when uh, parties uh, started its execution. Uh, such type of transactions, uh, for example, are loans, uh, collaterals, um, and on any other secure, uh, securities transactions. What it means? It means a uh, general legal principle states pacta sunt servanda, or any concluded agreement or contract should be executed. And uh, while in the REPA transaction, what we have, we have that under the first part, uh, securities are bought, on the second part, securities are sold. If securities are not bought, but contract is enforced, uh, in second, on, under the second part of the transaction, anyway, the, uh, the purchaser should to sell the securities. I think that this situation uh, could not be, and it's abnormal situation, and we should to speak and to do how to eliminate the risks uh, the risk of the purchaser under the first part of transaction. Of course, exist legal techniques how to reduce the risks, but uh, about this I will speak a little bit later. As well as uh, another problematics, uh, problematic of the REPA is connected with ownership rights, but I would say that this question is more theoretical than uh, practical. Um, I would say that we are not so many thinking about ownership rights, we're just moving securities and receiving securities. And what is it securities? We are not thinking as well, we are not thinking which type of the rights we are passing. Uh, but there's some uh, some theoretical um, some theoreticals of law is saying that uh, um, under the rapid transactions you're receiving a limited ownership. Uh, but I would say that ownership rights or title could not be limited because uh, in rapid transaction you have a possibility to sell the securities and to pass uh, to pass the securities. Uh, I mean to sell on the market. So it means that you will pass the securities with a defect uh, in ownership rights or uh, in the title. While when you are executing your obligation to repurchase from any uh, purchase uh, the securities from any other participants and uh, to execute uh, your obligations and to return these uh, securities. Uh, to the another part, so uh, I stay on the position that. Um, yes, uh, that REPA transaction is transaction on term, but this transaction on term is not connected with um, with the uh, limited ownership rights, but is this more connected with uh, obligations which ex exist between the parties during this certain period of time. Um, currently, uh, I am working on um, Mm, how to say on the uh, on the purposes of the rapid transactions and um, uh, what I'm trying uh, to say uh, to say with uh, this may be my slide. First of all, it's clear that economic uh, essence of the transaction is financing. Securities financing when you need securities or funds to increase in liquidity. But when we are looking on the transaction from the perspective of the purpose, we have two type of, types of the purposes. The first uh, purpose uh, type of the purpose is how to say objective, what I would like to have at the final, it's the first. And the second, why I would like 
to have something. Uh, first of all, purposes, increasing liquidity. So money driving, it means I need money. Uh, speculation, securities driving. I would like to increase income, I would like to trade. I would like to execute my liabilities. For example, under another transactions, uh, when uh, somebody uh, can't, um, uh, when when I wait in the delivery of the securities, but they are not delivered, but I need to execute my obligations. I am buying them on the market and executing my obligations to prevent future losses. Uh, increasing of the participatory interest, securities driving. When I have small piece of voting rights, but I would like to participate in the voting and I would like to vote and I would like to vote in a similar certain way. So. I am entering into rapid transaction. I am understanding why I need the securities to be recognized I, uh, as, as the owner of uh, securities for a certain period of time and to vote. Uh, and um, as this is a fully normal issue, for example, if you would like to have like as a five persons or more to utilize your shareholder rights under certain conditions of the law. And uh, another one objective purpose of the transaction is decreasing of the participatory interest. Money, uh, this transaction, I would classify like as a money driving transaction, but um, this is, um, I would say that from the perspective of law, this transaction is a um, transaction which could be recognized like as a uh, null or transaction which not is in the force. This is a very risky transaction uh, when I need a lower participatory interest in the company. But uh, why? Why uh, I need something? This is like the subjective side of the purpose or motive uh, for the transac transaction. Why I'm doing it? not what I would like to have, but what I am doing it. So first purpose is uh, our, how to say, my internal purpose, tax optimization. But when we are speaking, uh, uh, I told to you that one of the obligations which exists between the parties, uh, when the, why the pa uh, parties enter into these transactions, this is uh, to, to get uh, tax advantages. <clears throat> because recognize an owner on the transaction could be another party. Uh, but where is the border between tax optimization and money laundering? This is a very good question. And currently I have no answer on it. But I know that, for example, French report to prevent such type of the situation in Stain Wards, that we are not paying any income which is uh, which is received during transaction, including these fruits or persons or dividends, but we are paying at the back of the transactions. Uh, some author, uh, authors uh, are offering to prohibit to prohibit this practice uh, and prohibit such type of the rapid transactions, like the transactions which are driving to um, uh, to avoid to eliminate uh, provisions uh, uh, of the law. Uh, the next uh, internal purpose, which also could be quite illegal, uh, this is hiding of identity of the owner. Of course, uh, hiding of the identity of the owner. Uh, when you have uh, any um, corporate uh, um, corporate uh, meeting and uh, meeting of shareholders. Uh, the company is uh, asking about identity uh, of the shareholders. So if somebody not wishing to disclose his participation, it could be like an internal motive, for example, uh, the, another big shareholder dislike me like as a personality, this is why I not, uh, want not to be disclosed. Uh, this is one. But another one could be uh, when uh, uh, I have a big uh, amount uh, of shares, which I am 
holding these shares in difficult jurisdictions with difficult companies. And when corporate event occurs, I could be identified like as a person who need, for example, to do any mandatory buy buyback or something like that, or I should be registered with any government entity, or I, I don't want to be disclosed like as a benefit, uh, ultimate beneficial owner because my ownership in the company is more than, um, for example, 20%. Uh, and I'm trying to uh, hide my personality. Uh, I think that all these purposes is quite unlo uh, unlawful. And uh, when uh, we are dealing with, uh, especially financial institutions, and I'm working for financial institutions, so that time currently for fintechs, we could be very careful, uh, carefully uh, when evaluating whether we are entering into such type of transactions. Of course, this transaction also could be used for uh, for breach uh, for breach of the sanctions uh, to hide the personality of the sanctioned person uh, from the perspective of IML our uh, repo transactions are recognized like as a low risk transactions but my experience uh, confirms that uh, repo transactions are also widely used for unlawful purposes as well as uh, uh, for some uh, criminal uh, offenses, but my uh, research is not about that. This is only one topic. Uh, as well as another problematic of the repo transaction, especially when they are not specified in the law, this is a, um, a simulative transaction. Some, um, for example, uh, repo transactions could be concluded to avoid the necessity to receive license on financing. But this is, uh, I would say that small issues of the law which should be uh, discussed for um, uh, in the near future. Also, I identified the major legislation legal acts of Latvia which, uh, which are applied uh, to the REPA transactions. And there is also the law on financial, uh, on the market of financial instruments, especially 120, uh, 125th, uh, section 125. Uh, at the initial presentation, I told to you that it is very important that the difference between buyback, uh, buy, uh, sell buyback transaction and repot transaction is only existence or absence of the writing contract. Uh, let uh, to the repo, tran uh, rep, uh, repo transactions are recognized under the law on financial collateral, like the title transfer collateral arrangements. Uh, but in account accordance with the law on the market of financial instruments, uh, the transactions titled trans or collateral arrangements are prohibited. Prohibited. What it means? It means uh, prohibited, uh, uh, prohibited when uh, professional market participants, credit institution, uh, I mean bank or investment brokerage uh, company is entering into tra transaction with a private customer. This prohibition is done to protect like the investor uh, from um, excessive uh, risks related, uh, but related to what? Uh, investment companies and brokerage, how, uh, how, uh, bro brokerage houses use, uh, used, uh, previously used the practice when you open an account, you're providing uh, all your assets on title transfer basis and your only creditors, securities are not belonging to you. And to avoid this practice and to eliminate this practice, this, this type of title transfer collateral ar arrangements was prohibited. So, but uh, automatically while the REPA is title transfer collateral arrangement, REPA is prohibited. But at the same time, uh, buy sell back transactions which have very similar effect is not prohibited. And uh, I argue that interests of the customer are more protected when the customer has REPA transactions than two not connected uh, transactions like a buy sell back transaction. This will be, uh, uh, at the um, conclusions of uh, my uh, doctoral thesis. Uh, so 
what I am planning to do with it. Uh, currently, I am looking on uh, the structure of the law uh, in 2022 state enforced new law on um, a qualified transactions to to which uh, we could apply close out, close out nettings. netting. Currently uh, in Latvia, close out netting could be used only for uh, transactions where financial collateral is used. For Apple also, this one is used, but we have no description, any description uh, in the law, any financial uh, transactions, but this new uh, legal act uh, um, applies to qualified financial transactions. So I think that, um, I will propose to implement, uh, to introduce new law regarding uh, financial transactions and one of the transactions which will be described in this law will be a repo transaction. The same way I think that other transactions such as like a swap transaction, uh, like as a future transaction uh, also should be um, stipulated in the law and regulated at least initial basics, uh, because uh, to eliminate the risk, for example, I, I talked to you of real transaction, self-purchase transaction, uh, about execution of the transaction. We have only two options. The first option, describe everything in the law, and the second option, uh, describe everything in the contract. But we have uh, very low quality uh, of legal uh, of the contracts. It's first what uh, identified uh, during um, research of the market, I have a collection of the contracts. The second, uh, we have a poor level of the knowledge of the lawyers, especially on the area of capital markets and financial transactions. Still, we have no courses where uh, new lawyers uh, are, could receive uh, how to say knowledge uh, about capital markets, especially uh, capital market transactions. Yes, in Stra Riga Stratton University, we have new one course, uh, investment law, but the volume of the students extremely low. Uh, this is uh, this is my um, major reason that um, it, it should be law and the order of execution of the transaction should be stipulated in the law. Um, and this allows to us not to recognize um, a repo transaction like as a real type of transaction, a real transaction, but like as a consensual transactions as, a, as it is with sale and purchase transactions. Um, more about this topic, I published uh, one article in uh, this year, Ownership Rights on Intermediate Securities. Uh, so if you are interested in the topic, you can read it and I'm planning uh, a new one article. I think that during months or two, it also will be um, uh, published. So thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? Great, Tatiana. Thank you for your very specific presentation and very deep analysis. Uh, dear colleagues, you are free to ask a questions. Question. If, if there are no questions, uh, too specific. We, too specific. <laughs> yes, too specific and too deep, and maybe <laughs> you have already covered uh, all all all, uh, all topics in, inside the presentation. Uh -huh. Yes, just a brief comment. I have listened to this presentation before and we have exchanged some words and discussion during my visit in Riga. Even though we do not agree fully on our uh, like points of view. Uh, anyway, thank you for your uh, comprehensive presentation. It was very interesting and hope to uh, hope to uh, see the fruits of your research in the nearest future, I am in the final fruits. Uh, okay, now we can move to our last presenter, <clears throat> which is Ilona Latonova. I mean, uh, previously I uh, announced uh, Proud Moms, but now I have to uh, announce like Hero Mom of Five Kids, uh, dear Ilona. Um, a couple of words, uh, words about her uh, background. Uh, she uh, she has more than 20 years of working experience in uh, both uh, public and private sectors. 
Uh, at the moment, she is the lecturer and researcher at EA School of Business and Finance in Riga. Her topics are business models and international business growth. Uh, and most of her um, projects, I would say, have been linked to innovation, accession negotiations in the European Union, which was quite a unique project for Latvia and I think for most of uh, European, like developing uh, countries in European Union. So uh, Ilona has extensive experience uh, in working in auditing companies like Big Four, one of the Big Four auditing companies, KPMG. Uh, I won't go uh, through deeper of her background. She's also world. I, uh, I mean, uh, she's uh, she has also uh, leading position in the development of the Arena Riga project prior to the World Ice Hockey Championship, which is quite unique uh, achievement for her. So, uh, dear Ilona, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you, Vakho. So my topic will be design thinking and shared value creation, uh, because we really think that uh, design thinking as a method and uh, set of tools for the management is actually very important when you look at the innovation and new project development. And if we talk about circular business models, well, it's always innovation. Uh, so the research aims to identify methods that are currently being used in practice. Uh, if we analyze value propositions and creation for circular economy and circular business models, uh, the idea was that I will uh, analyze the articles which are published so far, uh, because most of the design thinking is actually described via case studies, so you can easily identify what uh, they're talking about. And uh, research limitations is, of course, that we are only talking about English and language, and we limit it to the uh, articles which use uh, business model um, as an approach in their analysis. So they use uh, keywords as value proposition, value capture, uh, and uh, there are more than 100 car of car articles like this. Um, what? Okay, it likes me. So this is a model of the design thinking, which we usually use when we talk about the phases. So the understanding, observing, defining, and then narrowing down when you define, and then you go again in the in the breadth of prototyping and testing while you again get to a more exact solution to your problem. Um, so when I went through the articles, uh, four major uh, activities uh, were figured out. Of course, the business model Canva as a tool has been used extensively. Um, education of management. So in order for companies to really create new ideas, they have been used games, cards, different kind of support tools, and just lectures about, okay, what the green theories are what the circular examples are you can see and so on so that's also another good way how you can actually get to a good ideas on how your business can be used and um, they also uh, analyze uh, business model innovation practices and researches typically last up to two years but also there's a lot still to be researched because case studies are analyzed but still further testing is necessary if that really brings results always because as we know a lot of publishing is just about the positive results and successes are nice but do are we sure that we are analyzing at the same time uh, the non-successful cases that's an issue um so right now for the further research uh, uh, that it is uh, suggested that you should use not just to analyze as I already mentioned, not just successful cases, but also unsuccessful cases and try different research methods than just case studies, but also some longitudinal, longitudinal analysis. Uh, the same approaches could work in different industries differently. They're only usually only applied in one industry and then already published well, they are not uh, tested in other industries because they're quite recent. We talk about last five, 10 years while these uh, approaches are being used uh, in the academic literature, I would say, because uh, businesses use some of these, at least as I've noted already much longer. And the complexity is something that uh, describes this because you have multiple players. So you sometimes try to 
have just separate phase analyzed rather than the whole case of the analysis. And also very often quadruple helix uh, is rarely analyzed. Usually it's business and suppliers, like the companies such as the suppliers or company and researchers. But the whole quadruple helix, especially with the society involvement, is very, very limited. Actually, I couldn't figure out too many cases where they really look in the case studies. When they write about the quadruple helix, it's usually quite theoretical because there are not sufficient case studies so far. And for the future research, we see that design thinking should either move to constructivism, where they go into critical thinking, or system thinking, because very often, design thinking is about one user perspective rather than the whole system. But in order to achieve win-win solutions, either you have to sit on each user's perspective, so you draw four user perspectives and then try to find some common, or you should use also different methods, uh, which are then uh, suggested by Varganti and Al. And this is actually a very recent discussion started just last year that design thinking probably is reaching its limits in the design thinking, uh, in, in the circular economy idea generation, because we need something more in order to be able really to create these sustainable solutions. So I was trying to be short as I'm the last one. I will only show one more table from the Verganti's actually ideas about the limits of the design thinking because they really do talk about multiple stakeholders and think on how really this uh, could be further research. So I would call people who are interested in the um, quadruple helix, uh, actually look at what, how the user-centered perspective is still valid when challenges are systemic. I think it's very interesting uh, actually area where we should research further. And by this, actually, I will say that I'm done with my presentation. So if anybody has any questions, I can answer them. But I decided that I will not talk into too long. So we have already had a very long two hour session. Thank you very much to your participants. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions, please. Ask to Ilona. I think our co colleagues are quite happy to hear what we have told them, but they'll probably need some time and they have our contact details. They can see us on LinkedIn so they can contact us at any time when they feel appropriate for further collaboration. So I think we are done tonight. Yeah, of course. Uh, it's, it's... I will also add that we will uh, have the uh, recording of our today's meeting. So I think we're going to share it with our audience. By the way, it will be uh, a very good uh, for uh, young researchers who are attending our today's event. If you share your maybe presentations so that we can share them with our uh, community so that in, in case they have any further questions or comments or suggestions maybe they can directly contact to you so uh, my uh, deepest uh, thanks to all of the participants thank you very much for very interesting presentations uh, thank you to professor Zintra a great friend of ours for having uh, and leading such an amazing team and team is uh, all team performs always uh, on top if the leader and uh, like the leading person is uh, at her finest so thank you Zintra um, uh, I have received a lot of uh, messages in my direct inbox about your team during the meeting so thank you once again uh, if uh, our participants have any questions or comments, uh, now it's the proper time to turn on the mic and uh, your camera. Maybe before some concluding remarks, I would like to say again, thank you for suggestions this meeting. It was really a pleasure to participate. This is like celebration today. And uh, there is satisfaction for uh, 
but we have a calculation today and uh, i believe in the spring season we again will meet together and to show what was done and uh, maybe we encourage again some researchers to do something uh, with us and maybe publish some results with us and uh, may maybe we will cooperate in the future uh, projects uh, but i think uh, today we had a lot of information uh, and keep working again and see again thank you Waho, for this uh, initiative i really appreciate it you are the best friend from georgia for me <laughs> and welcome to riga again thank you very much thank you too our next web webinar i think will be in october when we will host a team of uh, researchers around also uh, sustainability and circular economy issues from University of Granada. The project is called Remaker with four R's uh, at the beginning of the word. So the head of the project is, a, is the colleague of our friend, Professor Valentin. So the, uh, Valentin is also on the team. So I think it will be very interesting for you to join that meeting as well, and you will be able to share your ideas together and maybe plan some joint uh, publications or projects or anything. And uh, also, I hope to be on, on that team as well. <laughs> okay, thank you very much once again. It was a pleasure to meeting you and see you very soon i hope uh in in live meetings bye bye thank you everyone thank you bye bye, bye. bye.